I'm David Hawes, you know that. Um, I have been working with Mid Devon over the last 18 months on their design guide. Um, I've, uh, I, I work independently in a, as an urban designer, but I work with various other organisations. So I've been doing some work with Hias, Paul Botway, who spoke before lunch um, around the country. We've recently done some work with um, Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, looking at their kind of place justification for local plan policy, moving them on from a kind of numbers position to a more qualitative place-based uh, policy position. Right, I see your golden egg laying unicorn, and I raise you a Winnie the Pooh slide. Uh, I, th I thought at this, t at this time in the afternoon is about the right time for some uh, wisdom from Winnie the Pooh, and, and who doesn't like Winnie the Pooh? Um, it's just a, a kind of lovely metaphor here for how some of us may feel about the processes that we're involved in within planning and design. Um, you know, I think, I think you, you good fellows in a room like this will uh, no doubt understand the value of design, and we do as a design review panel um, uh, encourage you know, a good design process. But it sometimes feels, that, feels as though you know, the processes, the systems that we're up against are just just a machine and there's an inevitability and you know what can we bring to bear really um, and if only we could just put the brakes on sometimes it feels like that if we could just put the brakes on this whole jolly process and just reassess it all and and bottom everything out then we could put in place a much better uh, undertaking and um, of course that that's not possible uh, we, we you know we have to be pragmatic in current systems and processes to do what we can and bring to bear the best effect that we can um, with the professional skills and knowledge that we have. Um, and what I wanted to say just at this outset, before I get going on taking you through the design guide, was something of encouragement, because I think I am finding that um, naturally the brakes are being put on, or there is a review sort of happening at this time. And I think Richard alluded to it a little. Uh, Matt as well talked about you know, a new paradigm, bringing ecology into design in certain ways. Um, and new master planning processes at certain scales, as Mid Devon are doing at Columpton, I think give us hope that actually design is on the agenda again. And um, I certainly get a lot more inquiries now that relate to justifying uh, um, policies, places, designs on a, on a more holistic basis and think about place in the process um, rather than have to pitch that so much uh, nowadays. So encouraging um, and stand firm, you good people. I think you know, there is change here and there's, there's good things to be done. So we're optimistic. So what am I going to do? I'm going to um, give you a quick outline of the design guide process that we've been through. And um, the key word there is the, is the process uh, standing out. Um, there is a product at the end of uh, this process that we've been through. The design guide in Mid Devon hasn't been adopted yet. We're in a draft stage, hoping to go to consultation quite soon. Um, uh, but the process has been as important as the product, product will be. Um, and then I'm going to introduce how we're going to run this workshop task, and we'll do that in two halves, as I described before lunch. We'll have a part one, which um, is looking to you to use the guide to uh, contextualise a site that I give you, um, think about how uh, um, the characteristics of the existing place um, might be described with reference to the design guide. And then the second part will be to try to describe that, not in your own words necessarily, but justified against and accountable to the design guide that you've got um, uh, by your side. And we'll hand out all of that stuff in due course to help you do that. So it will involve you kind of moving tables halfway through or joining tables, I think. We've got six groups, and we'll become three groups after, after that first period, OK? Good. So Mid Devon, um, this series of slides is sort of loosely based on some member training and um, engagement exercises we did through the um, authoring, through the um, uh, preparation of the design guide material. And um, one of the exercises we started with in a number of those uh, events was to take uh, members particularly, but it was a mixed room. Um, of officers and uh, local landowners and representatives of the public. Take them through um, a little game, really, to test members as to whether they really knew Mid Devon. And um, it was really encouraging to, to see members 
uh, correctly identify a series of random photos. I mean, we did some site work for a month or so around Mid-Devon leading up to this. We took something like 3,500 photos of different settlements around the, set around the uh, district and um, just picked about 20 of those to go up on the slides at these events. And nearly 100% nearly, nearly success of members identifying their places uh, in these photos and the, and, the, and the communities that they represented. And you know, what that told us, uh, I mean, I've got a few, there are a few you're not going to know them because you're not from Mid-Devon, it's irrelevant, but i put them up here anyway. Um, what we really identified through that was that, um, you know, there was, it, Paul earlier talked about um, design in two dimensions at a certain scale, but um, we've, we really saw the value of understanding places in, in three dimensions and really going to these locations and asking people, well, what, what is distinctive? I mean, you've given the right name of this settlement to this photo. There must be something that you identify with it to be able to, to, you know, to, to recognise that. Um, it's not just because it's where you live. And there were good and bad examples. And it started a process of responding to the brief that Mid Devon had given us, um, uh, which was born out of understanding the landscape character of Mid Devon. Now, you know, you could say that's that's quite predictable because it's a very rural district. Um, of course, landscape character is going to be key. Um, but what we what we did, and I'll show you how we've we've done it, um, was to try and connect landscape to the form that the settlements took. Uh, do that both historically but also through contemporary development to show how uh, the landscape character assessment that Mid Devon already had in place actually had some uh, tangible um, uh, application in identifying you know the difference in different places um, this one this one was this one was quite key so this is Crediton and it sits in a very linear uh, steep sided valley and um, it really has dictated uh, the good and the bad um, Where's the, the good and the bad examples of where development is either hidden in the valley and creates this very distinct linear form uh, or stands out like a sore thumb at the edges of the valley and it presents some of the challenges to developing in these settlements. And that's all you know, born out of the landscape constraints. Um, we, you know, we, we started to see how some uh, cherished features, some sometimes small pieces of public realm have been kind of dwarfed and overtaken by other landmarks that are not so uh, spectacular, but nevertheless stand out more to people these days. And there, you know, there was a reflection on architecture. It wasn't a, a heavily architecturally driven design guide, and you'll see that as I go through, but there was some reflection on where architecture, both historic and, um, a, a, and sort of late 20th century, can contribute to um, good pieces of placemaking, good pieces of urban design. Anyway, then uh, there was a question of the level of detail that we went, in, went into in, in the design guide. And um, uh, the word red sandstone just haunted me through the process of developing this design guide because it was the one thing that people, uh, some people, seem to think was the architectural, uh, I guess, the secret ingredient to distinctiveness in Mid-Devon, that if you were going to build a building in particular parts of Mid-Devon, then of course it must have red sandstone. And if at all possible, red sandstone that is quarried locally. Um, and so you face these challenges of what's actually possible in you know, contemporary development and um, what is cherished. And that level of detail was a debate that we took members through, we took officers through, and you know, there was an emerging kind of feeling that um, to get the urban design structure and the kind of holistic sense of place and connection between landscape and settlement form was a good direction for this design guide to focus on, given the, um, given the uh, extensive kind of variety across the district. And, the, and uh, as Jenny's already said, you know, the geographic size of the district meant that this took in an enormous variety of, um, of architecture and, and, and settlement forms. Right, OK, so just briefly then, among your tables, um, would you like to have a quick chat uh, answering this question? Um, where do you see, either through your experience or through your kind of per personal view of uh, where we are design-wise, where do you see the priorities um, 
in, in, in design. When you think of development, maybe your design review panel member, perhaps you've experienced design reviews. Um, what are the typical things that come up? Uh, and, and what are the priorities? So just quick chat and we'll come back in a second. Great, well, I mean, in that context, you know, uh, different perspectives on what's important in design. I suppose the question is, what's the role of a design guide then? And um, some, of the, some of the problem, um, I think, uh, is a little like this, in that we've, got, we've, we've roughly all got the same idea of what we're heading for, um, but different groups have a very different way of articulating that. And, um, and, you know, often actually in trying to head towards what we think is our perspective of priority means that we don't, we don't optimise what the, what the real opportunity is as a, as, a, as a shared process. So for us, the production of a design guide was not about, I think Richard mentioned earlier, you know, this was not about something that would um, put a cap on all things or any particular or specific feature or type of development. It wasn't about regulation so much as about conversation creation and process um, opening up a dialogue between all of these parties. And of course there are more, aren't there? I've just been naughty and putting these three down. But um, all of these parties coming together using a design guide to facilitate a conversation and a dialogue which helps them, one, along the process, and two, to create better outcomes at the end of that process. So a couple of boring slides with the bullet points. Um, so just to introduce then the, the, I suppose a little bit about the brief for the design guide, but also what it comprised. Um, the whole district-wide design guide, but that said, um, you know, particular parts of uh, the local plan um, uh, development allocations were in, uh, well, there were three locations other than uh, the main focus of this, of this design guide. Columpton, you've heard about. Um, has its own more controllable master plan process. Um, equally, development in Tiverton and, and Crediton, as the two other main towns in the district, had um, other master plan processes and design guidance, which we felt this guide didn't need to contribute to. So, geographically widespread, but actually concerned with a smaller proportion of, the de of development as allocated in the local plan. Um, it will become an adopted SPD, so we had to be quite careful not to be shaping any policy or being, uh, be seen to be uh, making any further policy, so we're in our right place in that sense. Process and product I've already talked about. Um, it was both a design tool for the design process, um, but also a development control measure. So we saw this very much as producing a handbook, a useful guide for tabletop use, and I'll come to how we've done that. Um, for development, manage, development management officers, um, as much as design teams on the applicant side. And there needed to be a certain amount of flexibility, not least because it was covering a very wide geographic area. Provide a common language. Um, and mainly, uh, you know, the purpose of doing that was to um, reduce the misunderstanding that there often is around what the design priorities are. As you know, we've shown in this room, there are many. What it doesn't do is, um, is, is negate the need for a design team or a design process. So it's not a simple off-the-peg solution to site design. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly, hopefully, a labour-saving device and produces some of the contextual analysis that you would expect. I think the National Design Guide alludes to the fact that there should be a, um, a local-level contextualisation, characterisation in place for reference uh, um, for design. And it does, it does do that, but it doesn't let you off of the normal design process you would um, undertake. So. Um, the fear that uh, designers are being um, superseded is not there. They're very much involved. Um, it doesn't establish a policy position. We were subject to site allocations and, and uh, the hierarchy of policy that Mid Devon already had in place. And of course, it doesn't do away with political and professional engagement. It looks to facilitate that and enrich that discussion. Right, so here we are. This is uh, what it looks like. You'll have, a, you'll have a feel of it later. Um, 
and um, comes in four volumes, which doesn't mean it's massive. Um, it just means it's very carefully uh, thought about application of different parts of the um, design guidance we have. So um, what we've got is um, a, a very slimline introductory uh, volume about the process of design and how one might go about um, structuring a good design process. And it has various cross-references to um, other national resources and references that you can use uh, to uh, inform the design process. Um, the substance of material that relates specifically to the Mid-Devon landscape and townscape is in these two uh, central volumes. So volume two we've titled Designing for Landscape and Settlement Form. And volume three is a compendium of district design. Now coming back to that question of how much detail you go into in a design guide, um, this volume uh, pertains to all these various subject headings that so in some cases go into quite a lot of detail. Um, characteristics of chimneys, um, types of fenestration, uh, use of materials, but it does it in a sense that can be applied across the material in this document. So one of the debates we had at the outset of structuring the content of the guide was whether actually you could justify having these headings under every single settlement or area perhaps within the district, as in was there a particular fenestration in the east? And was there a, a different gable end style in the west of the district? And these sorts of things. And we resisted that quite heavily. And our advice was actually, it would be good to put together a, a complete district compendium of design examples. Um, we drew a golden rule about photography in that every single photo in the design guide is from Mid-Devon. So it's not one of these documents that shows <laughs> that shows your kind of um, urban design porn from Stockholm and every other, every other lovely place that we all know it's better to live than where we live uh, in a document and, and create something unattainable. What we tried to do was bring Mid-Devon to the document and represent every single uh, uh, um, principle and objective of the guide through a Mid-Devon series of photos and, and precedents. Um, so that's what that third com uh, compendium does. And then the final document is um, a series of sort of, I guess, global issues for the district as they consider design. Um, there are more topics actually than shown on this slide. This is a bit out of date. Um, but things like you know, design and accessibility, they're not things actually that aren't considered in these other documents, but they just pick up some of the more technical issues that, um, uh, that need some special attention. And um, oh, I've done that. Um, of course, Mid Devon's got a wealth of other information behind this, and we were, uh, you know, we were very privileged actually, because all, all credit to the to the county to the district council, they had already done a good amount of work on landscape character assessment, um, and they'd taken that forward to this document, which they called their town and village character assessment. Um, it's it's a few years old now, but it's it's an objective view of where they're all their settlements draw their form from to some extent and it connects the landscape character assessment to what we see in, in, the, in the towns and villages around the district and I think it's a really good application of landscape character assessment actually sometimes these landscape character assessment documents sit there and get a bit um, dusty and nobody really knows how much you're supposed to refer to them or use them and this document bridges the gap so we saw this as a stepping stone to where the design guide could build yeah, so landscape character assessment looks something like that, but the townscape uh, document, towns and villages assessment, um, came up with these composite character areas across the district that were a combination of both, you know, what does the landscape look like, but also how has the townscape over time um, adapted to, uh, to make those areas distinct. So we adopted that same structure within the design guide. And there are early references to the landscape character areas um, as portrayed through the um, towns and villages character assessment character areas. And the, the first part of the design guide looks at some, very, some pretty high level design guidance or main design considerations as a result of those landscape character areas. And of course, you know, these documents being quite large, we wanted to encourage people to sort of springboard back into those documents and not regurgitate all of the work that the, the district had already done. But then we took that further and we, um, we, we took that further and um, 
those, uh, those weeks of, um, of field work that I mentioned before and all of that photography, uh, familiarization with all of the settlements um, around Mid Devon led us to this summation or character, uh, categorization, I should say, of, of seven distinct settlement forms. Okay, so they vary from a, a, a village that might be formed around a central square or green to a, a, um, something that's formed around a crossroads. Of course, any settlement doesn't fall. In, in a black or white way into one of these categories and um, you know so there's some discretion to be had about maybe picking one or two you recognize characteristics of some of the of, of, of two or three of these in one of the settlements around the district so the process would be that you'd pick um, you know you pick the type of settlement that your village was in and then we moved to elaborate that a little bit more and look at where sites within those settlements perform different roles so within a linear, this is a linear sort of form of village, um, it's no specific village in Mid-Devon, we didn't want to put the heckles up and draw particular places. Uh, this is a sort of semi-fictitious uh, place based on a number of linear villages around Mid-Devon. But within that settlement form, you know, there'll be different sites which in their different locations perform different roles within that settlement form. And so then we um, move to a section of the guide which has um, what we thought was a good uh, summation um, categorization of all of those uh, what we called uh, site situations um, you know sites that were right at the heart of a crossroads of a village are very distinct from sites that sit out on a on a limb um, in a dip, in a dispersed type of settlement and so there are many others 13 site situations and so the same went for every settlement type. Um, we took the settlement type and we looked at the different typical, you know, not definitive, but typical site situations that you'd find within a settlement. And um, then we moved to develop a sort of site brief scale level of guidance for each of those 13 site situations. This is just one of them. So Jenny mentioned that the brief for the design guide was for it to be um, easily applied and quite simple to use, not full of lots of jargon or regurgitation of you know, the standard design codes on urban design that um, you must have a front boundary and you must have a roof over your head or something. Um, you know, we wanted to get to the heart of the matter that was distinctiveness in Mid-Devon. And so simple diagrams about sites that were simplified was really part of our intention. <coughs> So then moving to the third, so that's, that's part of the, um, the second volume, and I've only done that in part at the moment uh, down here. So settlement typologies came from the rural settlements part of the local plan. Um, there were two other uh, tiers, if you like, of um, the local plan policy or the development uh, policies, the three main towns and then the countryside, but I'll come to them later. So we've looked at... Um, how, how we use the landscape character to structure uh, decision making about where your settlement was, some high level guide design considerations. Um, think about the rural settlements uh, um, in respect of their form and the settlement typologies, sev seven of them, and then those 13 site situations um, that could occur you know, across a number of these different settlement types. But now I'm going to move to this. this third volume and just show you what I meant by that having application across those previous parts of the guide. So we had, I think it was, uh, weirdly, it was 13 again. It's just a magic number in this project. Um, uh, 13 headings under the compendium. And we had a, a simple spread like this, which we worked really hard to keep concise, which um, had some objective uh, expressions of where we felt um, you know this particular heading uh, was represented across the district and they were very descriptive they, they didn't mean to be um, uh, recommending any particular one of those you know in a situation but then we used the second side of the spread to look at where you know you may apply um, different thinking around this particular heading to different scenarios in those site situations um, 
you know, so materials may be useful in a, in a landmark building and that could be uh, the tool, the, the work you put that to as a tool in your design process. Um, they may be used to create contrast along, uh, you know, a continuous frontage. Um, and, you know, there are various, various ways in which um, we, are, we look to articulate this particular subject within the original uh, settlement form diagrams. So just coming back to these other two parts of the second volume then, the main towns and the countryside, um, one of the, I suppose one of the um, counterintuitive things about this design guide is that um, Mid Devon's uh, development allocation is 90% in their main towns. And yet this design guide is very light on design guidance for those three towns. And that's for the reasons I mentioned earlier and the Com Garden Village master plan process being a good example of how that's actually a very, um, already a very harnessed design process and there's, and there's other master planning and design guidance work being prepared for that. Um, so in the main towns, 90% um, of the development, that leaves 10% of development to be everywhere else in the district. So why bother doing a massive design guide on only 10% of your development? Um, well, because it doesn't necessarily only have 10% of effect or influence on the character of the district. In actual fact, you could argue it has a much dis a higher disproportionate effect on the character and, um, and quality of design as seen and, as, and perceived across the district because little bits everywhere could really stand to affect you know, what you perceive as, um, as a high quality environment or not. Um, what we did do for the main towns was um, a, a sort of high level framework plan um, which looked at where some of the opportunities to do similar things to what we described under the site situations diagrams uh, might be presented and um, I'm sorry if you can't see all of this these are just pages from the design guide so you, you don't really need to read it all you'll have a look at it later um, and it just drew out some sort of key principles across the town um, acknowledging that in these larger towns it was, uh, it was more difficult to say whether they were one or other particular settlement form typology. So, I mean, Crediton is a, this is Crediton, um, is a particular example. It does actually display a very linear form of settlement due to that kind of steep-sided valley in which it sits. But Tiverton and Clumpton, you know, they have a very mixed form and it was difficult to say they are a particular, you know, individual uh, settlement typology. Um, so we allowed for the fact that actually you may, you may look in some places and, and want to influence um, you know, a linear form of development along the high street, for example. But in other areas where development was sort of um, splurging out the end of the valley, there were other you know, uh, parts of the principles from across the design guide that might be appropriate. So um, we did that in this way. And then in the countryside, um, we, uh, again, boiled things down, distilled things down into what we felt were four uh, particular typologies for development in the countryside. Now, of course, there weren't any development allocations in the countryside. This is a policy um, that uh, it's, it's, it's everything that's outside of settlement boundary. Um, but nevertheless, there is the pressure, as um, uh, Richard mentioned, I think Jenny mentioned as well, of permitted development, you know, having an influence and a larger influence now with extended permitted development rights. So we thought it was um, useful just to identify that you know, development in the countryside still has some form and some settlement typology uh, um, observations to make. And, um, and so we just put these simple things together. And it may be that you know, someone extending their house in the countryside may want to think about whether they're part of a terrace or if they're a, a standalone house in the countryside. And you know, these other two um, typologies also, you can imagine different conversions and refurbishment just taking account of that. And, and you could move from one very distinctly to another without really noticing. But we, we included this in, under this uh, tier of the garden, guidance to try and maintain some of the qualities that the, each of these typologies bring to the landscape across Mid-Devon. So there we go, that's the content of the design guide in a nutshell, that was uh, fast I know, but um, you'll get a bit of better chance to get familiar with it as we put it on the tables. Um, 
Just to introduce then uh, the subject matter of what we're going to look at in the workshop, um, we're going to, uh, si similarly to the, you know, the design guide diagrams, what I want you to consider is a site that we've got, this is not it, this is pretend, believe it or not. Uh, think about the whole place, uh, but also think about where the site I'm going to highlight to you might sit and how the role of that site has, uh, how, how that site has a different role to play depending on where it's located. And um, using the design guide, it would be quite good to piece together where some of those um, architectural features, if you like, in the third volume from the compendium, offer different opportunities in these different sites. So the site we're going to look at is in a, it's not in a mid-Devon village. I thought doing something in a mid-Devon village might be a little bit contentious, even though we're talking about the mid-Devon design guide. So I've chosen another site that I've done some work on in a neighbouring authority. This is East Devon. And this is a village by the ex-estuary. Um, uh, and um, you've got these plans on, on your table in a minute when I hand this stuff out. So this is just a, a plan showing where the history of the village, uh, now one village really, or one community, um, where the history has been uh, fragmented in the past in the darker areas of the, of the older parts of the village and then it's spread out from those sort of three, um, three hubs. This was originally a, a more of an agricultural community here and here. And it wasn't until later that they developed a water frontage. So this is the sort of Victorian part of the village, and this being the older part of the village. And then uh, there isn't a key on this. I'm sorry about that. But there, these, these other uh, dots are sort of suggesting that there are um, centers of activity around the village, depending on your perspective. So um, down here, we've got um, a couple of the pubs and the sailing club. Uh, and you've got the school is further up the village. Um, there's a recreational space here, a big playing field. Uh, there's a church in the middle. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of old, uh, they're redundant now. They're not, they're not used as shops anymore, but there is a sort of old row of shops at the top of the village that would have been a centre for the community there as well. So um, that's just to give you an idea of you know, different parts of the community using the village in different ways. There are different centres, depending on your perspective. And then a series of routes. Um, and you'll see on the aerial plan that I give you that that relates uh, to the kind of landscape continuity through the village as well. So pedestrian routes leading into what is the site in the middle here. So um, this is the site we're going to be thinking about in our little exercise. It's an old um, garden nursery. So there's some uh, derelict greenhouses, quite a lot of derelict greenhouses and polytunnels. And the site's um, been identified in the neighbourhood plan for a... a a, a sort of moderate amount of development um, and uh, I picked up the, the project just as the landowners were thinking about how they might push that a little bit further or what was the appropriate amount of development in the context of the village form. Um, so I'm going to give you a photo sheet as well um, and I'll just take you through a few little views now and how we did some assessment locally of um, the form around the village. So. Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, just some simple analysis about how um, you know little composition pieces, little little uh, view compositions in the village are made up of um, you know a variety of gable ends and mixed pitch uh, um, and, and ridge, he ridge heights around houses. Um, unexpected things, I suppose, that the formality is, is um, sometimes created in, vi in village centres with relatively modest features, you know, a small fence and a small brick wall, but that gives a real boundary to the public realm and yet doesn't obscure views through to other more prominent buildings. Um, the um, counterintuitive nature to, to the uh, uh, counterintuitive to an urban designer is that some of the main routes through to key places within uh, settlements like this are often hidden and even unmetalled and they're marked very subtly by you know those who know know that this leads down to the harbor um, uh, but buildings nevertheless you know answer that and face on to uh, little routes secret routes if you like and then sometimes the role of uh, particular buildings is quite surprising. We've got um, a very, very narrow street here. Um, there, there is actually some parking around the corner here and a double garage because this house at the end is, is quite, a, a, quite a large house. And so in amongst these tiny terraces, tight-knit terraces, some of them back-to-back -back with no gardens, um, you also get cheek-by-jowl um, 
uh, six, seven bedroom uh, detached houses with double garages, just squeezed in there somehow. Um, So this is so this is the site plan. Um, the, the site is um, on a south-facing slope. So there's a brook here that runs all the way down the valley to the estuary, and this is the main uh, road that runs through the village all the way again, all the way down to uh, what some might deem the centre of the village, where most of the facilities are. Um, Grave One listed church opposite here, and that slopes um, away at its entrance to give a. a, a, a not a protected view, but a very cherished view in the locals' view, and that was something that was picked up in the neighbourhood plan. Series of different constraints around boundaries. So, um, being a garden nursery, it's it's got no permeability really. But although there was, you know, a significant access for vehicular. Um, uh, vehicular access at the entrance there. There are a number of other buildings that look towards the, su the site. So there's a uh, double fronted, uh, double bay fronted Victorian house here that looks onto the site. The church overlooks the site with the view over falling ground. Um, and then these neighbouring uh, houses, the, the greenhouses being set back, uh, mean that these um, these neighbouring terraces, you know, sort of turn the bookend, if you like, to the site. And this view leads out down the valley across the estuary. So there's actually quite a long view had as you approach the site from the east going west. Um, existing greenhouses and um, very mature oak tree sitting in the middle here. And a, and a sort of small wall, which you can see over. Um, but nevertheless, for, for pedestrian use, this is a, there's no pavements to this road that come around the, the north boundary to the site. Um, so it, it's, and it's a, it's a kind of key route to the school, which is just across the road. So there are some concerns about the safety of that road on the north side of the site, where there may be more access to further development of the site. Just to give you a sense of scale then, these are three different... Um, uh, areas of the village overlaid on the site red line. So we've got um, the, the denser uh, fishermen's sort of area down on the water side um, yields around 40 units for an equivalent red line area. Um, the medium density uh, partway, sort of partway along the, the road out of the village on that, on that plan I showed you uh, would give you about 25 units and that's some sort of barn conversions into semi-detached houses and some uh, mid-20th century uh, semi-detached houses. And then the very lower density, which is prevalent in the village in some of the cul-de-sacs at the edges, uh, so latter part of the 20th century, um, would give, uh, give you about six units on the site. And there were representatives at local um, events of each of these areas fighting for this to be the right response to the site. Um, so I'll let you draw your own conclusion about that. Uh, done that one. Right, so I'm going to give out these site plans. I'm going to give out the design guide, and um, we can get cracking.